Welcome everyone. A very, very warm welcome to you all. I'm Cynthia Lazaroff and I welcome you all this morning from the island of Kauai with gratitude from this land I'm blessed to steward beneath the mountain Kalalea, sacred to the Hawaiian people, the original stewards of this land. It's an honor to have each and every one of you with us today. You're an extraordinary group of women, awake to what's at stake and above all you care. With all of my heart, I thank you for your dedication, your courage, for showing up to be part of this dialogue at this time of great challenge and opportunity in US-Russia relations. And a very special welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time and to our remarkable speakers, Kekesha Basu, Melinda Davis, Marina Pislakova Parker, and Gulnara Shahinian. We're especially honored to have you with us today for our dialogue on COVID, climate, and nuclear weapons, disproportionate impacts on women and girls, and what we can do. Our dialogue is a collaboration with Women Transforming Our Nuclear Legacy and the American Committee for US-Russia Accord. With deep gratitude to Katrina Vanden Heuvel and to our dear friend and part her partner, Nadia Ajgikina, and to my mentor, Colette Schulman, this gathering would not be happening without the three of you. And I'm so grateful to you, Katrina, Nadia, and Colette. You've all given so much over so many years to improving US-Soviet and now US-Russia relations, inspiring me and so many. Thank you so, so much. This is our fourth dialogue. And for those of you who haven't been with us before, over the past year, we've explored nuclear dangers like the risk of accidental nuclear war and the disproportionate impact of nuclear weapons on women and girls due to ionizing radiation. We've also explored challenges in US-Russia relations, ways to overcome any enemy stereotypes, the history of citizen engagement, citizen diplomacy, and the role we as women can play in working together to reduce tensions the, and the unthinkable risk of nuclear war, and ultimately to eliminate nuclear weapons. Today, we're gonna to be doing something different. We're going to be looking at how the existential threats of COVID-19 and the climate crisis disproportionately impact women and girls and how the solutions to these problems are linked to reallocating resources spent on nuclear weapons. And once again, at what we as women from nuclear superpower adversary countries can do. In her compelling new book, Cassandra Speaks, Elizabeth Lesser says, when women are the storytellers, the human story changes. Excluding women, half of the human race from policymaking and decision-making for much of the nuclear age has brought us to the brink of possible extinction, to the end of life as we know it, of everything and everyone we know and love and cherish on this earth. We're here today because it's an existential imperative that we write a new human story, and the four remarkable women we have with us today are all doing just that, each in her own way, doing pathbreaking work, taking game-changing action to change our human story. After our speakers, we're going to open the discussion. We wanna hear from all of you. As you listen, we invite you to think deeply about these questions. How do the existential threats of COVID and the climate crisis, crisis impact women and girls disproportionately everywhere? At a time when US former Secretary of Defense, William Perry says that we're at a greater risk of a nuclear catastrophe than during the Cold War, how can we as women come together strategically across borders to address these common existential threats, especially those of us who are from the US and Russia, the two countries with over 90% of the world's nuclear weapons? How can we come together in a way that demonstrates our ability to cooperate and solve problems together that builds confidence and trust and can serve to improve relations, reduce tensions and the risk of nuclear war? What can we as women do? What are some solutions? What are some practical concrete steps that we can take locally, nationally, and internationally to address these impacts? How are the solutions to COVID, the climate crisis, poverty, hunger, and all of the urgent issues calling for our attention in the world today intersectional with disarmament and the trillions of dollars being spent on militarism, nuclear weapons, and war? And finally, how can we as women reimagine and advance together a new definition of security for women, girls, and all. With that, 
I'd like to welcome my dear friend and partner in this work, Nadia Ajikina, to share opening remarks. Welcome, Nadia. So happy that you're here with me and all of us. Uh, good, uh, good evening, because it's evening already in Moscow, in Russia. Thank you, Cynthia. I'm happy to be together with you. I'm honored to be part of this very important initiative, this dialogue. What started uh, long ago, what started uh, more than 30 years ago, and I'm happy to see Khaled Shulman and Katrina, you mentioned, and you, you participated, and many Russian women as well participated in those maybe romantic, but I think it was very pragmatic initiatives. It, uh, we faced uh, really pragmatic uh, steps to, uh, create, uh, to creation of the better world world without nuclear arms, without hate, without aggression. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we see how strong aggression, how it is raising, how it is ubiquitous uh, during COVID time especially. But I think that women altogether could find the way and probably to show the way. I do remember how several months ago when we started Svetlana Alexievich Nobel Prize winner in literature 2015, uh, she was with us and she shared her experience about Chernobyl and about uh, COVID and she compared and I, I do remember we had an interview with her for the Nation magazine about COVID and she said that it's a new threat, we cannot identify we cannot touch it, we cannot smell it, we lose our smell. Probably we can lose something more. Uh, but it is important to think about it and it's important to deal with it. And this threat is equally uh, dangerous uh, as a nuclear threat as well, we do not know. And when we started this uh, session, we suggested to devote it to uh, not to top level agreements, but to COVID and women's experience during COVID. It was uh, in October and uh, some of us, for example, me, I had COVID a year ago, like many of my friends and colleagues in Russia, by the way, men and women of different ages. So we in Russia had a big number of people who already had this disease. Fortunately, many survived, unfortunately, uh, some people passed away, uh, but we couldn't predict that we could face a new wave of COVID now. So it means that we are uh, now in a very important point to discuss women's experience. And I'm happy that we have today uh, so distinguished and uh, fantastic speakers. And I do believe that as a result, we could find some not solutions, but some ideas and probably some frames for our future development. Thank you, Nadia. Um, and I, I just want to say that we literally wouldn't be here today without Nadia because she reached out to me in October and said, I want to do another dialogue before the end of the year and let's talk about women in COVID. And then COP26 happened and we thought, well, let's do it about women in climate too. So. Nadia, this is your inspiration. And again, really thank you for bringing us all together today. Really very, very grateful. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. And I'm so honored to have with us today, Keikasha Basu, who is a United Nations human rights champion and founder president of Green Hope Foundation, which she founded when she was 12 years old. She is a peace and social justice crusader author, musician, and passionate advocate for the sustainable development goals, nuclear disarmament, children's rights, and gender equality. She is the youngest recipient of Canada's top 25 women of influence, winner of the 2016 Ch International Children's Peace Prize and the first ever Voices of Youth, Gorbachev Schultz Legacy Award for Nuclear Disarmament. Her organization works in 16 countries to empower young people and women especially those in vulnerable communities in the sustainable development process. Welcome, Kekesha. We're so happy to have you with us and we'd love to hear about your work on our theme today because you're working in all the different areas that we're addressing and it's just so great to have you here. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the introduction and hello everyone. I am speaking to you today 
from Toronto, Canada, which is uh, the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. So as Cynthia mentioned, my work is with Green Hope Foundation, the global social innovation enterprise that I founded nine years ago. And our work is basically to ensure that no one is left behind. And we see uh, these challenges on the ground every single day. 12-year-old Nazima wakes up before dawn each day and her first chore is to walk several miles in the darkness to collect water from the only well that still has water near her village. And with every passing year, she has to walk further away from home uh, for this precious life-giving resource in this parched land, which is the run of Kutch in Western India, where she and other girls from the indigenous community of Agarias, who've been farming salt for centuries, live. Her next chore is to collect firewood, and she spends the rest of the day cooking, hunched in front of the fire, inhaling the toxic fumes, cooking and caring for her siblings as her parents work on the salt pans for less than one US dollar a day. School for her was a dream, and especially as a girl from this conservative community that still frowns on education for girls. Now, if we move thousands of miles away across the ocean in Kenya on the shores of Lake Victoria, the same story plays out for the girls in some of the villages there where girls like Elena spend their days collecting water and firewood instead of being in school. The increasingly severe impacts of climate change that manifests itself in extended droughts and land degradation has really pushed these invisible communities to the edge of the, their existence. And these are the stories that don't make it to the Western News Challenge. And it is within these communities that my work centers, working to build resilience amongst those who are most impacted by our world's greatest challenges, including climate change, the pandemic, and uh, the onset of nuclear weapons, and really to make sure that those who are least responsible for it are not left behind. I'll start by focusing on our work on ensuring climate justice for all. And we've seen firsthand that the threat from climate change comes mainly from the fact that it's not obvious to most people. It's happening right in front of our eyes, yet we do not see it. And even if we do, we assume that it's a problem for someone else to solve. And it's this lack of awareness and apathy that is the basis of my crusade through Green Hope Foundation, because my team and I noticed early on that the impacts of climate change have a disproportionately higher effect on those people and communities least responsible for it, and amongst them, girls and women who also suffer significantly more, increasing their vulnerability to abuse and exploitation. And not only does climate change have unequal impacts, it exacerbates the existing inequalities. And an additional complexity arises from the fact that there is still no single set of gender inequality reducing policies with relation to mitigating the impacts of climate change that applies to all countries all or in all contexts. However, the main issue is uh, with the implementation process that's combined with a lack of intent. And in addition to this, uh, what we've encountered is an absence of even youth and gender uh, data in most countries, especially in those global south uh, countries where majority of our work takes place. So this translates to a situation in which one cannot measure or quantify the impact, which then leads to an ineffectual response mechanisms. This is a vicious cycle on inequality. It gets deeper and more convoluted making the recovery process even more complex. So we must first begin by remembering that empowerment and gender equality are multipliers of sustainability and peace. And the inverse also holds equally true. Women often have different vulnerabilities to 
climate change to nuclear injustice to lack of peace and that gets further amplified with other intersectionalities and this often yields varying perspectives on the extent and seriousness of these problems and the best solutions therefore defining dynamics within households including between children, youth, people of different genders is critical to fully understanding our local environmental and social behaviors and their outcomes. For instance, we witnessed during our work in the Kenyan villages how climate change impacts freshwater availability as well as the increase in land degradation, which disproportionately affects the women and girls more because as the majority of water carriers, women and children not only spend a substantial amount of time and physical energy fetching water, but also risk injury and assault. In many societies, women have traditionally been the keepers of rich knowledge about plants, animals, ecological processes. So the erosion of biodiversity driven by climate change has had specific impacts on women, including losses of knowledge relating to seeds, processing, and cooking. We've witnessed this in our work with rural communities in the small island developing states, for instance, that we work in. So addressing this above really requires the climate change mitigation efforts to be viewed in action through the gender lens, empowering women and girls, ensuring that they not only have a voice, but also a place at the decision-making table. And this is exactly what we do at Green Hope Foundation. And Throughout our journey as a social justice crusade, my mission has always been to highlight the fact that the two greatest challenges of our time that are posed by climate change and the threat from weapons of mass destruction are interlinked. Overriding this all is an even greater menace and one that is deadlier and more sinister and one that serves to accentuate the dangers posed by the climate nuclear nexus. And that was what I was speaking about earlier, which is the threat from human apathy, because it is this deep rooted apathy of complacence that really we refer to as an acute manifestation of myopia that has allowed the threat from both nuclear weapons and climate change to grow and fester just as cancer would really eating away, hollowing our entrails and just pushing us to the edge of a precipice from there can from there, there can be no return. And it's really this apathy that allows billionaires to burn billions and trillions to fuel space missions at a time when millions can't even get their first dose of the vaccine. And now during the pandemic, much of my work is within these communities in rural LDCs and amongst these indigenous uh, communities whose lives have been upended by this human apathy that allows uh, corporations to categorize indigenous lands to as deserts to justify its pollution and degradation from uranium mining or its degradation from the impacts of climate change and biodiversity loss. Once again, these are people least responsible for this degradation, but the irony is that they suffer the most from its consequences. So it's critically important to expose this concept of terra nullius, two words in Latin that exemplify this colonialism that translated literally means nobody's land. And this is how Western colonists still classify lands that they seek to exploit even when these territories have been inhabited by generations of people who've used their traditional knowledge to thrive symbiotically. COVID-19, of course, has amplified these existing inequalities, pushing them further back into the mire of deprivation and poverty. Amongst their many projects at Green Hope Foundation, one of them has been with an indigenous forest dependent community in coastal Bangladesh in Sundarbans, the world's largest mangrove forest. Where literally cut off from modern civilization, they have been helpless witnesses to the destruction of these mangroves from pollution and logging that leave them exposed to sea storms. And the increasing frequency of typhoons, be it Cyclone Isla or this year's, uh, last year's Superstorm, Cyclone Ampan and Yas, kills thousands in these communities, not one of which gets reported. Now, we as a youth led civil society organization spend our meager resources in building resilience within these people, providing them with the support to 
regenerate their local environment and societies and giving them the skills to establish a local circular economy so that they can rebuild their lost livelihoods. But that includes powering education through uh, solar grid installations and solar streetlight installations to building toilets for them to give women and girls safe spaces. One US dollar a day equates to a day's meal for five in these villages. Now, if we compare that to the four billion that goes into making a Trident submarine, that is gross. While there is still some awareness and accountability in the West on military budgets, it is still completely missing in other nuclear states. Recently, I came across this documentary titled The Buddha Weeps in Jadugoda, a film that was made in 1999 that very people few people have actually heard about or seen, but it tells this heart-wrenching story of exploitation for decades of an indigenous community in Jadu Goda, which is a sleepy hamlet that's the epicenter of India's nuclear program, and from whom it depths, uh, from whose depths it really mines the uh, uranium. And the worst part is that nothing has changed since that 1999 film, apart from greater deprivation and mortality in which these indigenous women of the community suffer disproportionately more as widows, as mothers of children with deformities that are all caused by nuclear radiation. The literacy level is a missile, and it's indeed ironic that not very far away from Jadugoda is the place where Buddha, the apostle of peace, attained enlightenment. The uranium mines and the nuclear plants that process the yellow cake have polluted the environment to such an extent that this once burden and green region now really resembles a desert. And the fact is that this is not an isolated case. It is happening in nuclear states around the world that hide this ecocide and human deprivation from the rest of the world, causing death and misery even today. And the situation is actually set to even worsen, as for instance, India's Minister of Environment announced at COP26 that they'd move away from coal towards nuclear power because it's apparently cleaner. So it's really this proverbial shift from uh, the frying pan into the fire because the nuclear process from extraction to waste siting weeks of colonialism and environmental injustice. But what befuddles me is that this doesn't appear as flagrant to the erudite white people who guide policymaking and guide the politics of nuclear armed states. And what allows them to act with impunity is uh, the general apathy of the populace as well, who just shrug and change their TV channel whenever posed with this dilemma, assuming that climate change and nuclear injustice only affects communities in Congo and Nepal, for instance, places too far away to bother about. But it is time that they woke up because it is knocking at our doorstep. The forest fires are burning down cities and towns across uh, the North American continent, as well as in Europe. Even as I speak, the province of British Columbia in Canada is submerged in floodwaters while in the same region this summer, a town called Lytton was hotter than the Rubalkali, the empty quarter in Saudi Arabia. We are really way behind from where we really should have started taking action. But as an eternal optimist, I do believe that there is a semblance of hope if we stop this wastage of resources and move the nuclear weapons money, that is the epitome of profligacy into meaningful development for equality, for gender racial equality to rebuild better so the future generations are not left to deal with a hot, barren planet. Thank you. Remarkable overview, that extraordinary overview and bringing forward stories from the water carriers and making this really personal for all of us and, and bringing these stories right into our homes this morning and touching our hearts and, and connecting, as you said, the nexus between climate and nuclear and explaining to us how all of these existential threats, these three threats exacerbate one another and, and giving us really specific um, ideas of what can be done 
on the model of what you're doing in these communities. And you know what you said about really helping us understand how the most vulnerable and the least responsible suffer the most. And it's really imperative that we address this uh, on a global basis. So thank you for all of that. And um, so happy again to have you with us. Nadia, if you, I, I'm coming back to you now to introduce our first Russian speaker, Armenian speaker, whoever wants to go. Marina. Uh, you know, uh, Marina is one of the most uh, uh, fantastic women I ever met. Uh, Marina is really one of those who started uh, uh, Russian-American cooperation uh, in the women's movement, very fresh and very um, naive in the 90s, but Marina was the first person to establish first uh, uh, crisis center in Russia. In 1993, she established Anna Center. Uh, now Anna is an uh, association of crisis centers of Russia. And I should tell you, I, I cannot imagine how she managed to do what she did and how she still has the same courage and enthusiasm. It's a secret. I think that universe supports her uh, and uh, no doubts. She has a mission. She is a person for others. You know, it is very hard to deal with this issue. I do remember how I was a young journalist in the best uh, avant-garde, uh, uh, like uh, a flagman of uh, Perestroika and Russian democratization uh, weekly, Aganyok. We covered everything about Soviet past, about Gulag, about corruption, about everything. LGBT was our welcome topic. I published personally many articles. It was almost 30 years ago. But to publish about domestic violence was not very easy and very progressive. Probably the best editor of Russia, Vitaly Karotich, and the editorial board fantastic people they didn't understand they did uh, uh, they told me that it was just private thing could just marginal families faced it and it's not a serious issue for our best in the country uh, uh, magazine and it was a fight for several months until the first publication about domestic violence uh, was published in this magazine and i was uh, uh, well, I was a journalist, very respected in the magazine, but finally we managed. And since that, it was like a breaking of, uh, it was not a Berlin Wall, but it was a wall in our souls. It was wall, some, uh, not glass, but very substantial wall in our public opinion. And since that, we see real results. And it was, of course, uh, uh, it was obvious that it was because of our crisis centers, about our women like Marina. Marina was first, and she still is the first, and I'm happy that she is with us. Um, thank you, Nadia. I'm really, um, it's difficult to speak after such an introduction, <laughs> uh, but I will try. Um, Yes, uh, the situation with violence against women globally, uh, and of course in Russia, uh, became much more visible. It became worse and became much more visible during the pandemic uh, for obvious reasons. And some of those reasons are connected to the nature of um, uh, crimes like domestic violence, because they thrive in isolation. And that's what happened during the lockdown. But on the other hand, it's also due to lack of effective systems of response. And unfortunately, not only in Russia, even in those countries where there is good legislation, where there is funding, where there is um, um, good level of response uh, in general, during the pandemic, uh, the situation was changing. For example, even here in the United States, um, I've heard from activists that um, uh, restraining orders were not served in the beginning of lockdown because nobody knew how to enforce it and where men would go. So a lot of um, 
situations. And of course, now, if we compare a situation to Russia, where there is still no law on domestic violence, domestic violence is still not defined in, legis in Russian legislation. Uh, and of course, as a result, there is no uh, efficient response from the state to uh, crimes like domestic violence. And what we saw last year, uh, starting uh, from March, when the lockdown was first uh, enforced in, uh, in Russia, we started seeing uh, a significant increase in crimes of violence against women and girls uh, nationwide. There were differences. Uh, for example, um, uh, we, I mean, I was not aware that in Northern Caucasus, we do have FGM. And we had FGM cases in Dagestan during the pandemic. Um, uh, for example, uh, Santa Ana, we run a national helpline, which is um, 24 seven. The increase of calls to our helpline within two months was by 74%. And, um, and so in the absence of the state response, everything fell on shoulders of women's groups, crisis centers, um, frontline activists. So just to give you a picture, during the lockdown, uh, nobody could leave um, an apartment or a house because uh, people would pay fines for that, for violating, say, it, it was called self-isolation lockdown. So uh, we started seeing cases that women who fled from violence were fined by the state. Um, as a result, nine NGOs, we united ourselves in one coordination group. And we are still actually, it was urgent response at that time, but we still continue coordinating our efforts because with limited resources, uh, state shelters were closed uh, because of quarantine. State social services were closed because of uh, the quarantine. Um, what we were doing, uh, we were placing women in hostels, hotels, uh, renting apartments, trying to um, find any accommodation. But we also wrote an open letter last March. We opened, wrote an open letter to the government uh, of the Russian Federation requesting that women who flee from violence are not fined. Uh, so the government heard us, but unfortunately only in May when the lockdown was actually almost lifted. Um, so with increase of cases across the country, um, the Minister of Interior at the same time reported a decrease of domestic violence, official statistics, by 9%. And that's clear why, because women didn't feel uh, safe to call the police in the lockdown situation because they were staying with perpetrators. So they would just flee and um, you know, flee for their uh, run for their lives. Um, at the same um, last year, one example, uh, there was a woman in Chechnya who was beaten uh, to death by her husband. Um, there were no investigation or arrests made. Uh, and this is just one example. And of course, uh, the situation became, um, it's becoming harder because as we all know, the cycles of violence that appear during uh, the pandemic, they don't go anywhere. This is like, you know, um, a storm. Uh, one wave after another will come and get uh, stronger. So we still have uh, an increase uh, the statistics of our helpline shows that, for example, by the end of the last year, we had um, almost 50,000 calls to the helpline. Uh, by June this year, we already had almost 30,000 calls to our helpline. Um, 
that shows um, and and also other organizations like the consortiums of women's NGOs who runs a national legal help um, program. Uh, and we work very closely. Uh, other NGOs like Zona Prava um, and um, organizations that provide legal help and uh, shelters and crisis centers, everybody is overwhelmed, but additionally to providing help with no state support. Frontline activists are attacked by groups like male state, uh, the organization with the, that was recently recognized and as an extremist organization. For example, uh, our helpline was under attacks for, the, for two months this year from um, this group with their supporters calling with obscene calls. It puts additional pressure on activists. Activists are threatened, attacked, and there is also no investigation on the state side of crimes like that. So what do we see is, uh, and of course, I think what is important to understand, um, um, is that it's all rooted in gender stereotypes. Unfortunately, uh, Russia um, is in, still in a very patriarchic, state of mind. Uh, the recent survey of the Institute for Socioeconomic Studies, for example, um, shows that still 85% uh, of respondents believe that man is the main breadwinner and uh, protector for a family. Um, but there is a what we noticed um, uh, and here I'm speaking also not as an activist, but as a researcher. There is a very interesting trend that women start becoming more demanding, uh, expecting from men not only providing um, uh, financially for a family, but also participating in household work and, um, and caring for children. And um, I can tell you, I was fascinated with some in-depth interviews that we've done through a survey in Russia. Um, we had a question in this interview uh, that was asked both, uh, both men and women were asked this question. Should, in your opinion, should men control women? And men, all men said, yes, of course, I am a man, you know, I'm entitled. And the women were saying, well, you know what? I earn not less than he is. Why should he control me? I, and, and that was fascinating. I think it was, there is a shift that of, um, in um, women's consciousness in Russia at the moment. And um, I think the pandemic that demonstrated also through the research, we found out that um, uh, the uh, um, amount of work at home during the lockdown and during the pandemic uh, grew by like grew almost twice uh, for women. And women were mostly, uh, it was mostly women who were responsible also for taking care of children, entertaining them. But uh, 40% of those women were also working remotely. So we can just, you know, imagine how long uh, was a work day for women in Russia during the lockdown. I can say that there is uh, actually a slight shift on uh, uh, in men's behavior as well. We noticed that some men started taking some of the responsibilities for household work. Uh, that they were not usually um, uh, doing. Uh, and some men in in-depth interviews said that um, staying at home, uh, they realized how much work, household work, women do usually behind the scene, 
Like when he's at work, he cannot see that. But when he's at home, uh, it became much more visible. Of course, the volume of work, uh, as I said earlier, uh, for women became uh, much more significant as well. So um, stereotypes, gender stereotypes, and I think gender stereotypes are still strong because of propaganda of so-called traditional values. And because traditional values are not defined clearly anywhere, that became an excuse for discrimination and violence and used by some um, uh, ultra-conservative groups as an excuse uh, for not interference in the family. And that's where the obstacles for adopting alone domestic violence um, come so strongly still um, in Russian society. Although the good news, potentially good news, although uh, my optimism is becoming um, really um, much thinner now, um, uh, Valentina Matvienko recently mentioned that, uh, in publicly stated that uh, in December, a draft of uh, a law on domestic violence will be introduced in the parliament, in the Duma. Uh, what we don't know is um, which version they will introduce. Uh, the version that I was working on uh, back in 2016, and for that my organization was listed as a foreign agent, uh, that version was taken as a, um, main version by the following working group in the Duma uh, by Oksana Pushkina and, mem and members of her working group. Uh, but later, uh, Council of Federation um, started also working, created another working group uh, to develop a draft on um, of the law on domestic violence. And they, um, uh, actually um, put that uh, to the public discussion. And we saw that uh, what they're trying to do is also accommodate some uh, criticism from ultra conservative groups. And uh, we were cautioned that um, this working group could include uh, measures like mediation into a new draft. And that would be a disaster. So uh, we are waiting to see what will happen because most of activists that were working on legislation before, after me uh, and myself, we are not really involved in the process anymore. Um, so that we can see and we can actually report back to you sometime next year when we have more um, results or more clarity on that. I see one, some questions here uh, about the church playing a role. Yes, uh, unfortunately, conservative part of the church is playing a role in spreading um, stereotypes and also attacking alone domestic violence because they say that interference in the private matter in the family is not really allowed. And, um, and at the same time, to be fair, I can say that, for example, Kitish, one of the um, strongest shelters uh, and um, really organization that created um, safety uh, measures for so many women and saved so many lives, uh, is under the church um, 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 it, it was opened together with Orthodox Church, and it's located in church um, uh, in, in the territory of uh, one of the monasteries near Moscow. So um, there is um, there are, there are different trends at the same time happening in Russia, but unfortunately with. Um, state neglecting uh, crimes like domestic violence and honor crimes, uh, it creates uh, additional uh, 
pressure on women's uh, organizations, especially in Northern Caucasus, because uh, there were known uh, situations, for example, in Dagestan, when um, uh, uh, women's shelter was invaded by uh, the police and uh, a Chechen woman was taken back to home to Chechnya and she was forced to speak on uh, Chechen television saying that she was basically kidnapped by uh, women's rights activists. Um, so as you can see, uh, the situation is very typical. Uh, the situation in Russia is very typical in many ways. Uh, one is that women, women's rights activists are the main uh, force that is responding to different crimes against women, uh, violence against women and girls. And at the same time, as in um, other countries, um, there are threats from perpetrators, from conservative radical groups. And um, as always, it's uh, basically double pressure on activists. Thank you. I, I'll stop here and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Marina. You know, you, you've shared so many um, important and really devastating things with us today. I think your line, crimes of domestic violence thrive in isolation, really um, hit me very hard. Um, and that's something I'm not gonna forget, you know, that the way you've, you've very, very eloquent and very powerful. And, you know, the fear of women to report crimes of domestic violence during lockdown because they're living with the perpetrators, just giving us that picture. And then also of the extraordinary work you're doing with the hotlines and the support you're getting, you're giving to women and um, that what really the state is of domestic violence in Russia and the former Soviet republics at this point without the support uh, the government support of any kind of legislation, but the courageous people like you and others continuing to try to fight for this and make it happen. So deep bows of gratitude to you for what you're doing. Very, very powerful. Thank you. Um, would now like to move to our next speaker. And we're really thrilled and honored to have with us Melinda Davis. Melinda graduated from the University of Notre Dame with a degree in psychology and peace studies and a focus on Catholic peace building. She's passionate about nuclear nonproliferation, disarmament and peace building, and has held positions with the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies, the Permanent Observer Mission of the Holy See to the United Nations. And currently, Melinda serves as a junior coordinator to the Security Task Force of the Vatican COVID-19 Commission which is the interministerial entity of the Vatican created by Pope Francis to respond to the pandemic. This commission is housed in the Vatican's dicastery for promoting integral human development, the Vatican's development ministry. Um, welcome to you, Melinda. We're so happy to have you coming in, zooming in with us this morning from Rome. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'll just share my screen here quickly, if that's okay. Um, please let me know if you can see it. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Looks great. Great. Give a minute for my computer to uh, catch up here. But um, thank you all very much for allowing me to um, hear from all of you and all of your wonderful experience um, in this, on, on all of these important issues. Um, and thank you for allowing me to share a little bit of the Holy See's perspective on some of these issues. My presentation may be a little bit different here, but I wanted to share some of our perspective in hopes that we'll, it could help further your reflection as well and share about some of the work that we're doing. Um, so as Cynthia mentioned, I'm working with the Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development. So that, I know that's a mouthful. Um, the Dicastery is one of the Vatican's many institutions and we work um, to promote integral human development in 
the whole world pretty much. So what's integral human development, you may ask? So here is our, our kind of our foundation is to promote uh, a human development that is focused integrally. So that includes every part of society, every part of the human um, that really focuses on creating an entirely new social, economic and political order that's really based in the dignity and foundation of every human being um, with the goals of peace, justice and solidarity. And um, our goal is really to make this, re this uh, a reality in every sector of society. Um, so our work is kind of guided by seven basic principles. I'm, I'm sorry if may, maybe some of you are probably pretty familiar with this, but I thought I'd just give a brief overview in case. Um, so all seven of these are um, kind of conceived to be essential to each other. So um, we can't, you know, for example, we can't care for our common home if it's not um, if decisions aren't made at the most local level, which is the principle of subsidiarity. And then that also means caring for the preferent for the poor and preferring their voice in um, making decisions on our common home on the environment. So all of these goals, even though they have very specific aims are all meant to kind of um, complement each other and serve as kind of an integral um, approach to solving the world's issues. And the church is really focused on working in all of these sectors and in every level of society, um, because as an institution, we're kind of unique in that we have a presence both on the international stage and in the multilateral fora, but also on the ground with our um, with clergy and nuns throughout the throughout the world, um, doing a lot of work in healthcare and education, etc. So, um, in our in our perspective, everything's kind of connected. So, I thought it would be helpful to to kind of give this overview because this is this is kind of the way that we're thinking about these issues. So, we know that the pandemic has brought to light all of these kind of interconnected issues, all these interconnected pandemics and crises and viruses of, of all sorts that have been present before the pandemic, but have been kind of exacerbated and just brought to light by the virus of COVID-19. So in response, Pope Francis created the Vatican COVID-19 Commission, um, which seeks to respond to the pandemic, to, to the pandemic and all of these various pandemics through this integral lens. And um, the, our goals are kind of to really um, be respond creatively, respond with urgency, and to highlight the local voices and um, campaign for their needs on the international stage and in, in every in every form that we can. And in in this way, we're really trying to work laterally across the Vatican and with parallel um, peer institutions, but also vertically throughout the church's structure, um, all the way from our UN missions down to the to the ground um, and so here is a kind of the structure of the commission if you're interested um, we have collaborations with all parts of the vatican so with my office which is the dicastery for promoting integral human development um, we're putting out analysis and proposals and research to support the vision um, proposed by pope francis and kind of scientific evidence as to how this really kind of idealistic vision is possible and then um, propose recommendations to policymakers throughout the world. And we do this in collaboration with um, Caritas Internationalis, which is our international aid agency, and with the bishops conferences in local churches. Um, and by really taking their feedback and saying, what, what are your needs? Let's, let's listen to what the, tr the reality is in the ground and, um, and hear from you what, what what are your needs and how can we broadcast them around the world? And we do that in um, collaboration with the Dicastery for Communications and the Secretary of State, which is our foreign ministry. Um, and of course, with the help of many, many generous foundations. And our goal really is to prepare the future today. So not prepare for the future, but prepare our future today. Um, and that includes 
um, raising the voices of women and of youth in particular. So um, uh, that's kind of Pope Francis's vision there is how I came to the commission because um, I'm kind of a unique uh, Vatican employee, I guess you could say, um, but we are really, um, we're really kind of paving the way. There's about 10 or 12 young women working here with us um, from all, all corners of the world. And um, we're really pushing um, to create a new reality, both within the Vatican and outside. So, um, so, what does, so what does the Vatican think about disarmament and security? What, what does it have to do with all of this? So as I mentioned before, everything, our approach is really to push this integral kind of vision. So in, in terms of disarmament and security, we, are, um, we are really think that a, a focus on integral security and human security is essential for, um, to move past this pandemic. So we really think that um, a focus on positive peace and not, not just the absence of violence, but really the presence of human flourishing and, um, and success in all parts of society and justice, socioeconomic development, um, respect for human rights and dignity um, and the participation of all um, are really essential to, um, to securing peace and um, stability in the world. And this, is different from the conception of state security, which kind of governs our current um, our current international um, states. So, um, so, in terms of disarmament, I, I just want to highlight one kind of thing. The Holy See has a has a huge has a very long tradition of um, of diplomacy and disarmament um, throughout the throughout the ages. Um, but one of the one of the major campaigns that we are um, proposing right now is against the concept of nuclear deterrence. Pope Francis was very clear um, in 2017 that um, that nuclear weapons should not be should not be the, uh, the basis of our international our, of our international relations because it really kind of um, bases our relations on force and domination and insecurity rather than law and justice and solidarity. So in terms of this, deter deterrence cannot be, um, cannot continue to be the world order because they don't focus, they don't pursue positive peace as I, as I was saying. And in terms of this, the Holy See, I'll just say was one of the first states to ratify the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and continues to campaign for this, um, especially by um, revealing its compat compatibility with the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and we'll continue to do that in the beginning of next year at the first meeting of states parties for the TPNW and at the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference in January. So, and uh, women were also um, a huge contributor to this uh, Holy See diplomacy throughout the year, so I'll just add as well. Um, okay. Sorry, my computer is a little bit slow today. Okay, so another, um, oh, did I skip a slide? No, okay. So another proposal from the Holy See regarding um, military spending and development from Pope Francis in particular is a global fund for development. So we know there's nearly $2 trillion being spent on nuclear, uh, on military spending and weapons. So Pope Francis's proposal is to create a global fund with all of this funding spent on military, on military expenditure that could focus development on and hunger. Um, I'm sure you've all seen that um, WFP and um, FAO are, campaigning for billionaires to support their work but i think really the military spending could could be where we could um, really tap into um and unlock some more funding and um refocusing um, world priorities on um in, in favor of development especially as we see from the pandemic that our true needs are not just are not found in state security they're found really in human security and health and access to labor and access to food, access to peace um, and security, um, and freedom from war and violence. So I'll leave that to you as, as food for thought. Um, 
And in terms of women, I just want to share that the commission has produced an executive summary on women in the COVID-19 crisis and how um, women have been dispor disproportionately affected, but are also can be the protagonists of regeneration. And I'll share this um, link in the in the chat after I, I finish um, speaking. And uh, we, we're try we've tried to lay out um, kind of the landscape and what is the situation at, at this point in time. Um, uh, when this was published in March of 2021, and what what is what are the implications of, of the situation, and what are some recommendations for governments, for societies, for local contexts? Um, so I'll link that later on for anyone who may be interested. And then I also want to in, invite you all to read um, Pope Francis's latest encyclical, which is called Fratelli Tutti, um, or brothers and sisters all. It's on fraternity and social friendship. And it's um, really helped to guide a lot of our work here. Um, but the focus on fraternity, solidarity, social friendship, in terms of um, focus on international relations and moving our society from one of, um, of that's over securitized to one with more trust and um, and, and human development. And Pope Francis addresses um, nuclear weapons in this um, in this um, encyclical as well. And I invite you all to think about um, fraternity, but also sorority, and what you know these concepts could give to us. And as we as we think about solutions for um, both international and local, and everywhere in between. Um, and my final invitation will be to, um, in terms of something concrete, that um, you may be able to join us in our um, Laudato Si action platform. So Laudato Si was um, Pope Francis's previous encyclical. It means um, praise be, and it's our, it's sorry, his um, kind of love letter to the earth and our welcome. Um, invitation to all to really ramp up um, efforts to um, focus on climate change and climate um, conversion and, and focus on an integral ecology. Um, so um, this effort is, um, is a seven year kind of action plan and a, a journey intended to support communities around the world to achieve um, our goals of sustainability. And it's really intended to be kind of this grassroots and unite all the grassroots movements and collaboration and give them kind of a platform to share and um, to share best practices, to build a sense of community and encourage actions from, um, from anyone who, who may be interested in, in uh, supporting climate, um, climate goals um, through the inspiration and the paradigm provided through Laudato Si and um, by the Pope himself. So um, we have seven goals. Um, and as you'll see, uh, related to many of the goals, um, the Catholic social teaching principles that I shared before, a lot of these are, are very um, integrally focused and kind of need each other to, um, to succeed. So um, they're all interconnected. They're all, um, they're all, they all work together and um, they're all, uh, essential to the to our broader goal of climate climate justice um, and there so the platform is open to all and open to anyone who may be interested and there's seven sectors it's a seven year plan it's a seven um, so anyone is invited to make a commitment um, based on your own um, your or your own situation or your own organi organization situation. And the platform provides support in discerning what programs and what commitments may be right for you and your situation to commit to um, for climate justice. So it's an environment and a community that you can join to um, support each other in this in this really tough work that, um, that you all are and we are all engaged in. Um, so that's it, but, um, I'll invite you all to check it out and thank you all so much for your work and thank you for allowing me to share a little bit about what you're doing. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you, Melinda, for that really, uh, really fascinating and, um, deep dive into the way the collaboration happens in the Vatican, which, you know, I, I certainly wasn't aware of and, um, it's it's really wonderful to hear about the commitment to raise the voices of youth and women and that you're a part of that whole effort and initiative with women from all over the world and that 
the leadership that um, Pope Francis and the Vatican has taken on the redefinition of security, that is not just the absence of war, but um, the presence of human flourishing um, was, was striking to me. And the integrated approach, which is what our theme really is all about today, um, that we really, that the leadership that he's taken and, and the, the Vatican has taken and that you all there who are working with him are taking um, in terms of disarmament and the work on the Treaty on the Prohibition for Nuclear Weapons, the leadership there on the definition of deterrence as, as um, not enhancing, but in fact, creating, not enhancing security, but creating insecurity, um, the leadership on climate justice, and again, the integration of everything. And the idea, um, which Kekisha also referred to as resilience, but the idea that women who are the most disproportionately impacted can also be, as you said, the pr protagonists for regeneration. That was very inspiring in terms of where, when we come to our discussion. So thank you so much for sharing this um, really wonderful work that you're doing. So Nadia, I'm gonna come back to you now. And um, if you would like to introduce Gulnara. Uh, Gulnara is, uh, I, I think we have a brilliant uh, uh, gathering of speakers today and very interesting discussions. I hope it will be very interesting discussion. Uh, we met with Gulnara is a person of a universe. She worked for the United Nations. Uh, she is leading a, a very important and very efficient uh, organization, uh, Women and Democracy. And uh, she uh, arranges gatherings of women from different parts of the world. Uh, it is very tough today to meet uh, for women from different countries, especially during COVID time. And she will be talking, I wouldn't like to uh, talk uh, a lot, but I just uh, would like to mention that one of her recent initiatives uh, devoted to uh, personal stories of women from 28 countries, one day, uh, there one day during pandemic time, uh, it's a, a book I hope uh, we could share and maybe discuss later this book and this initiative. It's a unique experience and unique document we have already. Uh, it is already one year and a half old. So it is a document of our epoch and it should be studied. And this experience, I, I do believe it could be one of our points for the future development of future discussions. And Gulnara had a very tough time because we, uh, uh, we have her just because of her heroic effort. Uh, she had the uh, fever and uh, she had very uh, sad consequences after uh, a shot, uh, so she had no COVID, but she had a uh, not very successful shot. Fortunately, she would uh, get a very, very uh, strong immunity, immunity, immunity uh, status now. So Gulnara is with us and I hope she will be one of us. Thank you very much, Nadia. Thank you very much, Cynthia, for invitation. I'm really, really very honored to be speaking at such a fantastic group of women and being at such panel. Uh, so, uh, and thank you uh, about your words on this publication. It's, we really love this publication. But before going to the book, I would like to speak about the organization that we established and the, because it's really closely connected with the, our work, uh, our book. Um, uh, our organization, Democracy Today, has been established just before, after in, uh, Armenia declared independence and when the first war started and the government doesn't have an experience in working with the inflow of refugees, specifically at the time of Propiska when every, everything was registered and these people are, were coming from Azerbaijan. So we had to host them and women's groups as volunteers, we decided to really establish a group and help the government as well as uh, government decided to take this very difficult path of building democracy among the states which were not very positively looking at democracy building, uh, mostly in, in the Caucasus. So uh, we decided to assist democratic processes in Armenia. And we were looking at democracy and uh, mostly we were helping, of course, programs for women, but we didn't differentiate between women and men because we considered that society has to be educated, everybody has to be educated on equality. 
in order to have really uh, egalitarian society and democratic society, we have to teach everyone. And we did uh, work in uh, different levels. We mostly work in border communities in Armenia and continue to work in border communities now after 30 years of war and with new war now, uh, where the border communities became much more vulnerable and people there with a the new decision became much more vulnerable. And, uh, you know, uh, we work also on regional, together with our colleagues in Georgia and Azerbaijan, we're trying to build, to build peace activities. And um, in 2011, we established this international, first of all, it was Young Women's Peace Award, which we decided to, be, uh, to establish for women in the Caucasus. But then we started to receive award, uh, you know, applications from different parts of the world. And this became already International Young Women's Peace Award. Though first uh, laureates were women from Chechnya and we were very proud of them that they run a risk to do this work. And uh, uh, you know, their communities applied for them. And mostly it was first our group was mostly women from North Caucasus and the Georgia, but then it started to develop. And now we have women, 28 women from different parts of the world, our laureates. So why I'm saying this, and this because majority of women who invested in stories in this book are laureates of our, our work, our uh, you know, conference. And the second element, uh, the, and this is not that women are receiving awards and that's all. Women, we provide them trainings to these women. We provide a lot of guidance how to deal with because these are the young women in their communities and they need support. So what was very interesting at the very beginning, the award was working as a shield for this woman, a protective shield, international award. But little by little, this process has changed specifically for the women in North Caucasus. And many of them became, uh, you know, now uh, agents as was uh, um, Marina Bislakova saying, the organizations have been closed and they have had to really uh, work in a different conditions. But, uh, you know, uh, because of that, we also established another level. All the women who are coming to our conferences are becoming part of the platform. Because we understand that in these days, when there are so many challenges that we're meeting, so we need to establish a, a platform to support each other. Solidarity is a very important issue. And there are about 250 women who have been member, uh, participating in our every year's conference. We have annual conferences every year dedicated to different themes. And, they, and uh, the, to discussions are invited government officials, religious leaders, uh, diplomats coming from different countries and participating in the conference as it became already an event. So this network, they became already a support network of women who are in a different city, difficult situation. When there is situation, for example, hard situation in Yemen, we all have come together with a, a statement or situation in uh, uh, now uh, Belarus or Georgia or situation in Armenia. So all of us are coming together. Last year, we issued a very important statement on 8th of March on release of women prisoners, political prisoners and send it to all governments of the world, all diplomatic entities and international organizations. So we also have this huge network of the, uh, you know, governments, uh, entities, diplomats, and we're sending whenever something happens, we receive information from these organizations, from these women, and we're trying to provide assistance like that. Or sometimes even through diplomatic channels in Armenia, and knowing that these women are facing challenges or problems in their own countries, we're trying to organize so uh, assistance. This is in general, but we'll do lots of work uh, projects for women from youth, because specifically we consider that youth are really our target group and they need to be involved in most of the project and most of the educational project. How this book started? You know, uh, 2020 was a very interesting year for women's movement because it was a significant year with lots of celebrations, lots of achievement that women made a progress in. It was anniversary, 25th anniversary of Beijing platform, declaration and platform of action, 20th anniversary of resolution 1325 on women, peace and security, 10th anniversary of UN women, uh, and many, many other uh, you know, accomplishments that women have made during these years. And, but, but COVID brought all of this 
processes on a different level. Many have been canceled, but many have been done on a, uh, you know, online uh, uh, format. But, you know, sometimes when we speak about uh, accomplishments, which is really very good to speak about, we have to also ask our governments about a lot of questions. Why the commitment that the governments have taken to protect women's rights under international law have not been fulfilled? Why uh, a simple, uh, you know, things like policies to guarantee women's equality and equity are not still there? Why women's participation in peace process and governance, right to vote and equal pay are still not upheld by governments worldwide? And having so many achievements, so many, uh, you know, uh, 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 um, responses that government had, many complex things uh, we need to understand on the different colliding factors, which include the global existential challenges related to deep economic recession, devastating climate change, extreme inequality, uprising against racist policies, uh, and, and the global rise of uh, and entry into political establishment of the states of the far right parties, which openly are misogynistic and se have sexist behaviors towards women in many countries, which has become acceptable as far right leader and now make negative commit commitments uh, about women with movement against uh, domestic violence all over in different states. And I re re recently even was hearing women from Turkey that also there also, uh, uh, you know, this traditional value concept has come up and in different uh, countries. So these were all the issues that I think we needed to discuss before COVID and we are stay unanswered. But I don't think that this question will not be answered. We, we will stay unanswered. We need to really discuss this with the government. Uh, irrespective of the issues that COVID has come with its, a lot of problems. When we discuss it, uh, you know, uh, uh, when we thought about this book, we thought about bringing the necessary experience. So the idea of the book has been very much related to the, uh, uh, you know, to what was happening. Because in the stories which are included in this publication, you will find some responses and some answers to what, uh, uh, you know, what I've said about the processes which are taking place in the world. Uh, so uh, situation of women uh, in different countries, like, you know, uh, gender-based violence, honor killings, children and abusive families impact, women's trafficking and forced labor, women working in shadow economy, uh, and the uh, 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 impact of climate change as we were discussing today, impact of conflict and war and financial crisis. So all of these aspects we decided to bring to this book and discuss with women and have an open discussion. So we asked women who are our award winner. At the beginning, the book was very much limited to our award winners. We decided to hit, have 80, 28 stories and uh, you know, finish with this. But then we found again, as with the award, we started to receive many stories. And we uh, opened the, uh, the walls of the uh, you know, book and we received 58 stories. And uh, there was a situation that we thought that we have to stop the process, but the stories were coming. We had uh, an idea just to publish uh, uh, the book, uh, you know, we have electronic version. But there is a woman, as I was telling today, 93 years old, peace builder from Geneva. She's standing before the bank and speaking about huge wealth that has been developed of wealth and militarism and how the young uh, generation likes to go to army. And she was calling us every time asking where my article would be published because I'm going to, you know, standing there before bank and I will my article is. So we had no choice. And we started our book happily with her story, with story of Louise. So other women uh, mostly were with the different countries where it was very interesting situations that, uh, you know, uh, COVID might bring uh, up. You know, when the people were speaking about having uh, hygienic me methods, sitting, uh, standing uh, from as far as, uh, you know, having individual space, uh, washing hands with soap, women from uh, Kenya wrote me letters saying that we do not have water. We do not know what is soap. We live under tents. What do they think about this distancing? 
And, you know, she, she wrote her story is about children who are heads of households because in her communities, parents have been killed or have died from AIDS and the older children have become house, household, uh, heads of household. So this is her terrible story. Or women from Iraq who were saying interesting story, bringing interesting story that for the first time, it was a barrier stop, barrier rest. They call themselves barriers. They came back home. And at the home, they started to put prepare dinner and to speak, to see how their child is growing, which they never saw because they were always helping others. And you know, at the same time, they started to learn about their family. So this is a rest or women uh, from uh, Cyprus, they're saying before we couldn't speak, we couldn't see each other. It was very hard to build bridges. Now through internet, we use internet and COVID to speak about very in important issues. And we developed the policies and there is organization hanging together. So they started to speak together, Turkish and uh, Greek Cypriots. So, Lots of different stories, and I, I very much like a story of a woman from Mauritania. I was just telling, it was fantastic finding. So in Mauritania, they, with the new government, they didn't allow demonstrations at all. And what women found out that how they can do it, they were standing one, only one person is allowed. They were standing one with a poster with their name and photograph on the poster, putting it near National Assembly, then leaving, then the next was coming. In a couple of days, they had three, 200 names and posters, and there was the asylum protest against their government. So government could not put them in prison because you know they were not there, but they had their action. So what was very interesting in this book, there was no anger. There was a fear of losing relationship, but hope of solidarity will help women. There was no uh, uh, saying that, oh, we are put in the hard situation. Women was trying always to find situation in order to help others, to, to write recommendations. A woman from Germany wrote a long list of recommendations to the governments, how to behave like this and how to build an egalitarian society where women uh, uh, you know, would get a bigger role. A woman from Geneva wrote about economic crisis and, uh, you know, Nadezhda wrote a fantastic story about women, uh, you know, journalist and the role of journalism in this issue. So this is this is collection of stories uh, of women and their life, in, uh, and we call it one day in the life of women peace builder during the time of COVID. So it's, it's a one day, they describe their one day. And uh, uh, there are lots of recommendations to the government and uh, we finish our book, uh, our publication with a very interesting phrase uh, of, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, here is also a very interesting um, comment from a woman from Great Britain who she says, uh, she's a, a long-term peace builder. We need attention, affection and support. We cannot give up our interpersonal relationship. We need love and we will be loved. And we finish this book with, a, uh, uh, you know, with the words of Murakami, who writes that once the storm is over, you won't remember how you made it through, how you managed to survive. You won't even be sure, in fact, whether the storm is over, but you pass through that. So thank you very much for this. It is very short presentation, but I hope you would be able to, you know, read this. It is on our web page. And, uh, you know, uh, we, what we plan, and Nadezhda gave a great idea, uh, we, we, this book was not about figures. This book was not about policy. It was about human faces and about human destinies, human stories. So we decided to make a live book one day to bring all those who have given us stories, who invested stories in this book and have a webinar discussing this book a year after. Thank you very much. They write our website. <laughs> Kulnara, thank you so much for sharing um, those little bits of all the stories. And everyone would like, I'm seeing lots of 
notes in the chat. People would like to get the link. If you could put the link to your book in the chat, so many people, including me, would like to read it. Um, I was really struck by your echo of what other women talked about uh, of, of, the, of the idea of solidarity and in particular the support network that you described that's evolved that is inspiring to us we wrote an open letter many of us in this group but that idea of a support network for women in difficult situations that mobilizes during those situations and comes together and and makes appeals to governments and policies on their behalf it's something we might be able to think about and talk about during the discussion and the questions that you asked that are really important, why 1325 hasn't been realized, you know, the commitments of governments that ha they have stated they would put forth for women's participation in peace processes and um, other things like that, and, and in uh, gender equality in governments and foreign policy and et cetera, why those haven't been realized, even though the commitments, commitments have been out there. Those are important questions for us, I think. And just again, um, your book so we the the your your phrase we need love and we will be loved was a i thought a beautiful way to maybe circle uh close the circle of of the presentations and go to the discussion and i would just like to invite now i'm sure there are many who want to speak and have comments so um please just come forward and we look forward to hearing what you have to say Would anyone like to comment or have questions for any of the speakers? Your hand. Colette? Colette, uh, Larissa, Colette, yes, please. Colette. You're muted. Unmute yourself. Yes. Unmute, okay. Unmuted. Uh, I'm glad to participate. If I look at the faces on the screen, it's clear that we there's an enormous resource here of experience, and uh, we've heard quite a bit of it today. What quickly stands out to me is the importance of uh, stories, yes, but I would like to see more anger in women, quite frankly. More protest, more demonstration, more uh, challenging in ways that we haven't tried. I think that we just need that now. There are any number of programs and and uh, and va and sort of statements of uh, from the Vatican. It's one, I, frankly, from the Vatican. What impresses me most is the Pope himself, the model that he is for so many people. And it makes it. I can't imagine that what Melinda referred to could be going on if if we had another kind of Pope. The, himself is such an important part of this. And uh, when I think of um, Marina working so long, so many years on domestic violence, I would love to hear more from her about what works. You know, it's been an up and down over the years, hopes and hopes dashed. But surely uh, were, over all that time, Marina, you know, you've learned what works best in some communities. So, for example, one thing that struck me is that when communism existed, for women in remote areas who were being beaten by their husbands, it was often the party that stepped in, you know, and, and, and put an end to that. Now, that's not the kind of control and, and, and sort of community that we want, but uh, it, it was effective in many cases. And so the question is, what, what, can one, what kind of people can one bring together and would a conversation between them in local communities make a difference? Between the police, for example, uh, between uh, other b conversations on values. I even heard in the discussion yesterday that among the st in the strategic talks that are taking place at a high level now in the, in between the United States and Russia, there is a thought of having a discussion about values in the two societies. And I, I would like to see that happen at the local level and also at the national and international level. I will stop there because I know many of you others have things to say. May I continue? Please. Yes. Please. Uh, um, and just a few words, um, maybe a, a few points that I would like to bring to your attention and maybe uh, 
somehow include in some statement that we might uh, produce somewhere on the way or maybe insert it into uh, some program. But uh, speaking of this actually rage and anger, um, it is uh, one of the things that uh, we should be enraged about, about, for example, what is happening in Afghanistan where a sportswoman was, uh, he had her, her head cut off for just being a sportswoman, an athlete. And I suppose we cannot be um, just quiet about that and saying that it is not happening. Uh, a lot of um, really enraging things happen. Uh, that is one point. Another point is uh, speaking about stories. Uh, we publish a magazine that is not influential, but it goes on as a university publication uh, maintaining uh, the momentum from the 90s when it was established to uh, the these days. It is called Supernova as Sverhnova as a star. But it is a Sverhnova Fantastica, Supernova science fiction, uh, but feminist science fiction. It is being informed by these ideas of the world, not just rosy, pinky world of, of future, but of some ways to reach that future from today. And without the image, we, we won't be able to do uh, and to, um, to reach for. We won't be uh, aware of what might be um, both the image to reach for and um, some uh, difficulties that can be envisaged on the, on the way to that. Uh, and I will finish just with one short um, episode from a story was just translated by uh, Mary Vibert about uh, uh, one step further on our explore exploration in the world um, on the Mars. Uh, just imagine that if Mars is being um, explored and uh, some human uh, some human um, um, presence is established there, uh, what should be the model and what can be the model? And the story tells about a woman who is found dead on, on the Mars surface, uh, desiccated, uh, because she was, it is called uh, uh, the person uh, plus one. It is, uh, as you know, it is plus one on the insurance. And it is about the world that continues in the vein that it is today, that it should be, um, the insurance should be necessarily paid for by your employer or by somebody else. But uh, what is the insurance for people in the future? Actually, that could be a topic maybe for some other uh, seminar about this insurance. What can be done um, by, uh, pressing the government and by um, proclaiming and defending the image of the future that could be livable. Uh, one of the very um, powerful images that it, it, it is connected with Star Trek uh, franchise and with this image of the future, which can be reached, but it is also now being um, somehow fuzzy. So we should be maybe renew uh, this path in some way. <laughs> so this, this is my contribution for today's discussion. Important to put forth a vision of what we want and where we want to go as part of our work. I think it's really important that, that we remember that. And Colette, I wanted to just, um, you know, thank you for for calling for the need for greater protest and um, allowing our anger and uh, Katrina wrote rage in the chat to come forward in concrete, constructive, nonviolent ways, of course. But, you know, and your question to Marina, what has worked over all these years? I just want to make sure we remember that as we move forward with the, with the discussion. <laughs> Invite Katrina, please. Uh, um, I'm, first of all, I love coming off the Star Trek franchise. We have a lot of billionaires who decided to go to space and they should go to space and leave them with us. Mm. Uh, I put in rage because it's interesting. I don't think of Colette in anger. I think of Colette as someone who's talking about constructive production <laughs> forward. But I do think this is a time not only of anger or rage, but despair on the part of many, I think that you think about what we read every day, if you have a chance to read and you don't work three jobs, but the stories of killings in Syria, the US bombing, 
and the um, stories of those who led our men and women in the field in Afghanistan who are on the board of the very companies providing the weapons and making millions and trillions. And they, part of the problem I think right now is people are so inundated. You don't have a chance to take a breath and think of how outrageous it is and what you can do. And I find these conversations very valuable if we can take a next step, as Colette suggested, what works, what can we learn? Um, because so much of, I think, part of the reason people go into government or don't, and I do believe that there's some very exciting women and people in our politics today, elected, and you need the movements as well, you need both, but that government can improve the condition of people's lives. And when people say, you know, you're so radical, I say, well, I'm for dental care, vision and hearing aids, you know, I mean, and it's like, or childcare, <laughs> child I mean, this is not radical. And so I think people, people sometimes don't understand. And I don't mean that. I think it's a politics that's dead on arrival when you blame the people or the narod, because often those in power know the truth. And so, you know, you got to, so it's just resilience, I think, is a word, because I can't speak for Russia, but America has been through a lot in its short history, and we have to think of the long road. But I do think that those who continue to work should be greatly admired because it's easy to step back and say, can't do it, you know, can't. But I do think working together, and I really do think at the demonization of Russia and China and you know, there are legitimate reasons. It makes one enraged to think Anna is registered as a foreign agent. But there, were, there are ways we can come together to talk about health care, child care, what's working, and make sure people know that. Finding ways to get it out to people, not in just traditional print, but in YouTube or, you know, it's a chance to communicate in different ways. I think it's exciting we're having a global conversation. We wouldn't have thought of it that easily a few years ago, but it seems more normal and to take advantage of that. So no big message, but just the one, the last thing I'd say though is December 10th. Um, and I agree with Nadia about Karotich and Yegor Yakovlev. They were very bad on the issues of feminism, but Novaya Gazeta is getting, an, um, a, its editor is gonna win along with a Filipino journalist, great journalist, the Nobel Peace Prize and understanding of the role of journalism. Novaya has not done a lot on domestic violence, but it's done a lot on the cruelty and condition in prisons and uh, really bracing and needing like a trigger alert. And a few days ago, there was some impact. There was some reform, uh, haven't followed it carefully, but I do think we can find ways through reporting, through exposure to at least bring that first stage of change and then make it productive. So I make a plea for, great quality investigative journalism, which is shorter supply here. And I know in Russia, it's very contested. So I don't have a Star Trek story to end, but. Things for us to do and um, continue, you know, taking this conversation, making it expressed in action of some kind. And again, we took that in our open letter but I think we can do right. more of that. We can do more of that. And, um, and on to show the model, solidarity. To show to solidarity. Show on the model of what Gulnara um, said, you know, having a network of women that come together and, and call and, and, and speak out at moments, I think is one thing we can do. Um, so thank you for all that. And who would like to go next? We have some amazing women with us for the first time today. So. Please don't be shy. Anne. Anne. Yeah. Anne, Anne is, welcome, Anne. And Anne is a gender, is a Rotary um, Peace Champion, an international Rotary Peace Champion. And we're really thrilled to have you with us with Rotary doing all the wonderful things that they're doing now for peace and um, abolition and you leading some of that. So we'd we're really thrilled that you're here. Yes, I'm, a, I'm involved with Rotary on some, um, conversations and projects with Russians. Um, and uh, that's been very fun. I'm really interested in the big picture stuff. And my go-to framework 
for all of these questions is how are we going to get power? So one of I I go to Gene Sharp. I'm a very simple person. One is one framework is enough. Um, and he talks about nonviolent power being very powerful and some various strategies. And honestly, in, pro in problems I've had in my life, when I lay out the framework and I say, who's my opponent, who am I, and what power do we have, and what power can I get that uh, this person doesn't have, uh, it, has wor it, has, it has worked so well. So I, would, uh, I, I think that's, that's my recommendation, is some good reading of Jean Sharp, who is works have been translated into hundreds, maybe thousands of languages and have helped people overcome really terrible power uh, disadvantages in their countries. But I want to point out just one, and I just wrote recently to President Biden. Uh, and, you know, well, on the one hand, he's saying it's Asian American hatred and, and prejudice and, and violence is so terrible. And yet every day he's talking mean about Russia, about China, about every adversary. And I say, excuse me, Mr. President, if you're talking this way, you are not only being violent toward them, but you are helping to inflict the very violence that we, you say you are trying to get over. So I think we have to call people on their I can cut it. Their, their, their claim to being so well human rights and everything oriented. And then they're doing at the very top levels the very thing that sets the model, that sets the tone for our own Asian American or whatever violence, indigenous violence, violence toward women, everything. We have to call them on it because everything right up to nuclear weapons is connected. So, bravo, bravo! I see. That's how I see it. Um, I'm very interested in talking to um, other American women and Russian women together in in the same house. Thank you. And thank you. We look forward to your bringing some of your Russian women to future sessions um, because we'd love to be working more with Rotary in what we're doing. Um, so we, we really look forward to that. And also, you know, your invitation for some, for, for to go back to Jean Sharp, creative nonviolence uh, and, and, you know, kind, creative nonviolent protests can be so powerful. And we have some really wonderful models from the leaders that um, at least I grew up with, we, those of us who are older grew up with. So I think that that's something to think about. And Gulnara's example of the women taking the, pictures, putting the pictures um, in the protests of their pictures and their names as a way, as a nonviolent form of protest that, um, you know, had to be accepted because they did it in a way that they couldn't really be harmed or arrested. So I think that was an interesting creative expression on their part under those really authoritarian circumstances. So thank you for bringing all that forward and, and for calling people out on setting a nonviolent tone, our leaders and setting the right example. I think that's really important for us in the context of what we can do. So thank you. Who else? Okay, so let's see who else is. Me? Uh, honey, honey? Me. Oh, Gulnar, did yeah. you want to respond? Yes, yeah. Okay. I just wanted to say about one very important thing. When Marina was speaking about traditional values, I wanted to remember how much we fought for the resolution that Russia has passed not to be uh, adopted by Human Rights Council. But irrespective of our pressure, because you know what does it mean traditional values when we have Universal Declaration of Human Rights and that resolution speaks about narrows down and takes out the role of women in society. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was there at that time, UN Special Rapporteur, and together with my colleagues, we were fighting in UN in order for the resolution not to be adopted. But unfortunately, we found out that we were not powerful enough not to allow this to pass. What the lesson we learned from that? So I think there are many early warning signals in a language, in a ways politicians are move, doing. So I think we have to respond much earlier 
then it happens. Mm -hmm. Because you can see in a literature, you can see in material, you can see in the language that politicians are using. And then the, you see the radicalization. So not to allow this to happen, I think there are so many early warning signals. So I think as women's group, we can also join together and uh, prepare declarations or documents, something, to, some actions in order not to allow this happen. So there are many lessons which I learned in UN when we were fighting, trying to do it. Like, you know, there was a rape uh, to the, toward the women in Haiti. I was fighting for four years to pass, uh, you know, to punish this uh, peace, uh, peacekeepers in Haiti. I didn't reach anything. But what I did, I spoke about it very unexpectedly at Human Rights Council. So then everybody recognized, oh, this is happening. So you, you have no choice when you are put to the uh, you know, wall. You have to develop you have your own weapons, so to say, against uh, uh, impunity of these people. Because for four years, I was writing to different government officials that these women have been raped by those who have to come to protect them. And nobody wanted to listen to me. They say, we're well, cynically saying that, oh, these are just prostitutes, what you are saying. That was the answer. So I had no other way. That's why before my speech at the Human Rights Council, I said, you know, I want to share with you a story which I want you to take with you and to really think about this. If we leave this impunity going on, we will have it in many parts of the world. So, so I think we have to be really very creative. And first of all, we have to see uh, early warning signals and address it immediately. So that's, thank you. for this note, this really important um, point that we have to really have our antennae up for the early warning signals and not wait to act until the harm has been done so badly or is, is, not, is not addressed. And also for your courage for sharing the stories to wake people up. So thank you for that. And I, I wanna just call on Hani um, Jodot, who's with us for the first time and welcome you. Hi, Cynthia. Thank you so much. Uh, this is my first time here with uh, this uh, incredible group of, of activists, and I am just so honored to be here. But I've been attending one of your calls before, Cynthia. And I just want to say that um, what I love about this group and what I love about your initiative, Cynthia, is that you uplift the voices of women of color. Um, which is, is, is it, it seldom happens um, in, in movements. And I will kind of go back to the Women's March and kind of what Colette was talking about and addressing is that um, when women are angry, they um, change the world, right? As long as that anger is peaceful. Um, but I have also witnessed um, that even within those movements, women of color are the ones who are spoken for. And oftentimes their stories are told through allies rather than having their voices uplifted, right? And us providing the support that they need to tell their story. So what I appreciate about these calls, Cynthia, is that you do just that. And I wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart um, for including women of every region, ethnicity, religion, and background, and providing that support really for us to all be here. Um, and, and the request that I do have for our allies is that, you know, in, in terms of intersectionality, um, it is very useful and helpful for us to allow opportunity and the platform to uplift women, especially in even angry feminist movements that we, um, you know, are behind to make that change, right? So that's all I wanted to say. And uh, again, uh, I look forward to the next call. And uh, yeah, thank you, Cynthia, and, and the speakers, really. Thank you, honey. You know, I, I feel that um, we, we are all in this together and that we need to be a, a, and embody the world that, you know, the, the world that um, Larissa mentioned, the world that we want to see and, and we have to do it differently. And so it's my honor. I've learned so much from my indigenous elder teacher here. And it's my honor to really um, celebrate and 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 um, and support in whatever way I can the voices of those that haven't been brought forward to be brought forward. And 
because we have so much to learn and everything that you say and, and that everyone has said on the call has been a teaching. So thank you um, for that. Okay, so Marina, I, I see that you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, it is a great meeting and it's an honor to, to again, to hear everybody and to be part of this powerful group. Um, Colette, I want to answer to some to, to your question first. Uh, yes, um, in the past 30 years working with violence against women in Russia, starting with domestic violence and then uh, finding uh, other crimes against women um, and addressing it, um, yes, I did learn a lot. And of course, um, we can do and we have to do things both locally and globally. And uh, locally, um, I agree that we need engagement of communities. And we did try uh, like different campaigns uh, in the regime, under the regime that we live now, it is harder for us to do uh, certain things. But I think uh, the new um, intersectionality helps. You know, uh, for example, uh, we are starting uh, programs working with um, issues of masculinity, toxic masculinity, because the real reason for all of our problems on earth is toxic masculinity that supports militarism, that brings inequality, invasion, and all the problems that we are having. So, um, the, another thing is that we, uh, we've we learned, and, and I started really believing that, and, and I see that, is that, um, you know, the, the, the problems with climate change are the same as problems with violence against women. It's the same route. Mm. And again, it is masculinity, because uh, men and boys are raised may in, 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 like, a lot of societies on earth learning just to consume without responsibility, consuming women's labor, consuming like from the very early, from early stage. And so, and, and root of violence against nature and against the planet and against women is basically the same. It's being in control, consuming and um, uh, not looking to consequences. So we, we are starting uh, new programs uh, on gender and uh, gender stereotypes and gender discrimination and um, addressing violence against women and nature. It's very innovating, innovative. We are still piloting, but we are looking for new ways of uh, broadening understanding of the root of the problem. Um, but at the same time, what do we do with governments like Russia? We need international accountability. And we need accountability, uh, not just in discrimination, but specifically with violence against women and girls. And uh, that has been a problem, um, as I said, not only in Russia. So I currently, um, participate in the global call for a new global treaty uh, addressing uh, the elimination of violence against women and girls. Uh, so it's called Every Woman Treaty. You can go to the website and I've been involved in that for the past um, seven years. And uh, it's a grassroots initiative of grassroots activists like me we were in consultations with our, among ourselves. And that's how I learned uh, a lot about violence against women and girls in different parts of the world that I was not aware of. And I can tell you what I've learned is that when we speak about violence against women, we mostly speak about sexualized violence, domestic violence. We do speak about honor crimes, but I can tell you the diversity and variety of honor crimes is so uh, dramatic on earth. And it's so uh, literally little addressed. So I think, um, and to me, a new global treaty that would 
be a global value. I mean, violence happens because it's allowed. So we, we need to have a new uh, global system that just simply will state uh, that violence is not allowed, not the soft law, not recommendations, because recommendations are not taken seriously. I mean, it, it's taken seriously mostly by the governments where it is, the situation is better than in the rest of the world. And I can tell you uh, that regional treaties are also, I mean, only 25% of women on earth are covered by regional treaties. 75% of women are not covered by regional treaties. Mm -hmm. So we do need to push harder for uh, a global system change and have a new framework that would address this issue seriously. I mean, I was as radical in, in this group as suggesting a criminal code criminal court on crimes against women. Uh, that's how I am fed up and angry. And, um, and it is very difficult because uh, we can see in funding, funding for prevention of violence, on prevention of violence against women is, listen to this, 0.002% of all global development funding. Okay, this is how much of a priority it is for men in power currently. Uh, Gulnara, thank you for solidarity. I think I agree with you. Solidarity is everything. During the pandemic, we became much more closer. But I think it's time, I agree with all of you, it's time for us to raise our voices as loud as possible and just demand system change. And that will come also from global to local. And of course, we need to push from local to global. Thank you. Thank you, Marina, um, for sharing your wisdom of, of all that your experience over these years. Um, and I this every woman treaty is such a powerful idea and something that for to come together around and in solidarity in the spirit of us all being in this together, it's really a beautiful aspiration um, for, for the future. So thank you for, for bringing that forward to us as something really concrete. Um, we're getting near the end of our time and Nadia, I'd like to invite you to give closing remarks. I wanna make two announcements before the end. First of all, that we'd like to we're going to be getting together again in 20, 2022. So look for us um, probably, I would say, February is what we're looking to for our next conversation, our next dialogue. Would love to have you all with us again. Um, and I wanted to bring forward a citizen diplomacy trip that our colleague Sharon Tennyson, who was here, a dear friend, uh, in the last session we did, is leading with Ambassador Jack Matlock next summer. And um, Tom is going to put the link to that information about that citizen diplomacy trip for, for Americans to go to Russia into the chat for those of you who are interested. And I also wanted to mention to all of you, there's a very exciting new initiative that the Plowshares Fund, who supported the launch of Women Transforming Our Nuclear Legacy through their women's initiative, has announced called Equity Rising. And it's a, it's a million dollar grant. Uh, it's a million dollar uh, availability of funds um, and it's specifically designed to bring for, for people from all over the world with a focus on um, women and women of color and um, people from um, LGBTQAI, just all, all of the, all of the um, underrepresented voices in this work. And it's the, it's the goal is to eliminate nuclear weapons, but you can apply from anywhere in the world. So we're also putting RFP in the chat and there's a, a meeting tomorrow about the grant um, at 4 p.m. Pacific. There are two more meetings that will be coming up in January and February. And if you can't make those, um, Plowshares has offered for to, to have private briefings and I can put one together for the Women Transforming Our Nuclear Legacy Network, but it's something that anyone anywhere in the world can apply for, especially they're looking, there's a certain part of the grant money put aside for people who have never been project leads before, who have never um, 
maybe done this kind of work before to really expand this work into new communities. So I want to just invite everybody to consider it. So with that, I want to thank you all and thank Tom for his amazing tech check, Nadia for calling this idea forward in October and for bringing all your friends to the table. All of you have come here today. I'm so grateful. And Nadia, please, would I invite you to, to close up our meeting today. Uh, thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, everybody. You know, I was expected, uh, I expected very interesting conversation, but now I feel really inspired. And of course, I do remember our first gatherings with American uh, sisters and colleagues and how it was strange, how it was happy. And we did a lot. We made, we made difference. And despite all political problems and everything we face today, we are together. We speak the same language. Mm -hmm. We understand each other and we are committed. And it is very important. Uh, Kalet asked Marina what uh, worked during all those years. Solidarity worked. Solidarity matters. Solidarity is much more important than we can imagine. It's, it's not a tool. It's our identity. And when we are dedicated, it makes difference in very different and uh, problematic environment. Uh, Katrina mentioned our strong male uh, media leaders. Fantastic historical people. They were not gender aware at all. They wanted to be distant. They didn't want to deal with it. But now our joint efforts, Russian and American, they made difference. In Nova Gazeta, new girls established the special committee in editorial board to combat uh, signs of sexual harassment. They didn't practice sexual harassment, but it's a sensitive gender, some moral committee. It's something new. And Dima Muratov, who Katrina knows, <laughs> he, he was very far from that. He accepted it. And he announced that he didn't understand until those young girls pushed him. But they did it because we had three uh, decades of our work and our struggle. And even uh, today's situation with domestic violence law, that of course it's rigid, it's not perfect, but we can discuss it. And now everybody in Russia accept uh, the notion that domestic violence is a crime. Simple police, Men, ordinary people, taxi drivers, men and women, totally young men, they do understand what it was and what it is about, that it's a crime, we shouldn't have it. I, Marina had a genius idea about involving males into this discussion. Now in Russia, we have discussion, hot discussion about torture in prisons. It's old from Stalin's, from uh, very old time practice which is uh, still unfortunately in the picture and everybody tries to to deal with it including different politicians very far from our uh, ideals uh, but we should connect in public opinion this torturing against all human beings in prison and domestic violence nuclear weapons and torturing our nature if we could find the words we could prove we could achieve much more than we can expect. And I would like to finish that uh, the idea that romanticism is very practical. It's very important to have a dream because this dream could be true. And I wish all the best in coming new year. I do hope that before our next meeting, we could uh, have a chance to exchange our ideas. We already got a number of great ideas. Let's exchange. Probably all together we could elaborate some, not a strategy, but so, something. Let's try to do that. And I wish you all the best. We will be happy. Thank you very much. Nadja, thank you. I just want to say that, um, you know, your, your words about uh, a solidarity is more powerful than we could ever imagine is a theme of our time today. And I just want to thank all the speakers and also that Paula Garb put into the chat right in line with your idea that maybe we establish a working group between now and the next session that she would be willing to help with where we can connect with each other to maybe share some ideas of how to move forward so we're not waiting until um, February to get started. So let's think about that for those who want to join, we'll be in touch. 
And thank you all again, incredible speakers, incredible participants um, for all of you for being here and echoing Nadja, happy, blessed holidays and new year to everyone. Thank you. So inspiring. Thank you. One small, may I make just a small announcement? Yes, please. Yes, uh, on the 16th and uh, 15th and 16th of November, of December, we are having conference on displacement because we are concerned of numerous forms of displacement they are taking place now in the world for yeah. political reasons, for climate, for war, for different, different reasons. So this is international conference. Part of it would be offline, part of it would be online. And you are all invited to join if you are interested. Would you send a link? Would you? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Our concern is that displacement, they cover with displacement word, you know, like a blanket, everything, every situation. But when a person wants to take a personal protection, he's not under this blanket. IDPs, what a very soft law, only refugees, which is an uh, old convention. Displacement, there is no word for displacement. So that's just a word for invitation to all of you. <laughs> I will send the link, okay? Thank you very much. Thank and you. thank you very much thank for you. this opportunity. Thank you, Gulnara, Kekesha, Melinda, Marina, Nadia, everyone here. Thank you so much.